Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet. Risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind bogglers. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp4u.com, mtp for you.com to start your 30 day free trial. I'm here today with uh, Ruby Alcantara and uh, she's an entrepreneur, impact investment practitioner, um, a public speaker, and she's been focused on entrepreneurship her whole life. Um, she's also lived in 16 different countries, um, including the UK, um, Canada, I assume, um, Africa, um, in a bunch of places like Tanzania, Nigeria, Madagascar, and Kenya. And she currently works with uh, Uciano Capital. I might totally mispronounce this. You have to help me with this, uh, which is a UK-based impact investment firm. Welcome to the Judgment Call podcast, Ruby. Thanks for doing this. Thanks, Torsten. It's uh, Uciano, Uhusiano Capital, which is Uciano. the impact yeah, what does fact, it mean? What does it mean? It actually, it's Swahili for um, acting as a bridge. So, be basically acting as a bridge between European-based capital to capital in Africa. And then I'm also the founder of Supiva Advisory Group. And Supiva Advisory Group is a Canadian-based entity uh, focused on uh, empowering women and empowering uh, focused on investing in women. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can again see you, you keep yourself very busy and we, we want to get into this and I'm, I'm really um, curious. Um, let's start out with, and that's for me also a new term, um, and we talked about that before, but uh, only briefly, w what is impact investing and how does it work and what are, when, when, when I think of it, um, I feel like it's a political entity. It's uh, you have a goal first and then you put money against it um, to change the world the way you want. Um, and the profits are not really important. Um, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a bad thing. Um, but, but what actually is impact investing? Sure. Um, and thanks, Tarson. And then I think that's a great um, way to start off for people who don't know what impact investing is. First off, um, one thing to clarify, impact investing is definitely for profit. Um, impact investors do want to make money. And basically, if you if an investment is not commercial, then it won't make impact. If it's not sustainable, it's not financially sound, uh, there's no way that it can make impact. So first and foremost, impact investing you always looked at it from uh, being able to make an investment. Now, impact investing started, basically it actually started under, um, back when Kofi Annan was the UN Secretary General, um, a number of key leading institutions came together to sign what was called the Principles of Responsible Investing. So you may hear the term responsible investing intertwined with impact investing, but basically impact investing is more of a, a, another form or a, another level of responsible investing. 
So you'll have investors who look at uh, metrics such as ESG, environment, social, and gover governance. Uh, but then you have the impact investors who will go another broader level um, and looking at how does my money make a greater impact on the community at large is the most simplest way of putting it. So um, one of the key frameworks that's utilized is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So there's 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, such as um, poverty alleviation, um, such as um, zero hunger, such as climate change issues, uh, such as um, uh, better health and well-being. So these are all uh, part of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, to give you the an idea about the size of the impact investment space. Um, last year, um, the Global Impact Investing Network, which is also known as GIN, um, basically published the report. And in 2019, um, assets under management for the impact investment industry was about 715 billion as a whole. Um, prior to that, um, the year before, it was about 500. Eight, so about half a trillion. So you can see that impact investing still remains and continues to remain um, increasing in its size in terms of assets under management globally. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, that's 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 very interesting to hear. What I'm what I'm I'm trying to filter out, and you, the expert in this, um, you know, the the for entrepreneurs, I think the uh, the inspiration, and for a lot of entrepreneurs um, that. Um, I met and uh, that are my friends, making the world a better place is one of the core um, ideas why you went into the field of entrepreneurship. And um, this expresses itself obviously in, uh, you know, somewhat, um, somewhat uh, different fields. Um, and uh, very often the, the impact is not as direct in terms of making the world a better place. I always um, use an explanation that entrepreneurship creates a new set of products or services and they will eventually find a buyer, right? It's a voluntary um, decision that buyers make. And these buyers transfer a set of money to you, to the entrepreneur, and say, oh, this is great. I want this and I'm ready to give you in exchange a certain amount of money. And what, what what's kind of missing, and, and that's interesting to, to hear that, um, is... And I feel like this is more on the investor side, but what's also from the entrepreneurial side, um, there's always a bit of a dark side, right, to entrepreneurship. You you can make money and make others' lives not so good. Let's put it this way. You might focus on your customers too much, but there might be external effects, and we know this from pollution, that actually make um, a lot of other people worse off, which is certainly something to avoid. And I, I think this is often the, the way how we define entrepreneurship, um, but I think in, in the community I've been associated with, um, entrepreneurs are um, kind of like philosophers. They want to make the world a better place and they want to use their powers for the good in this world. Not everyone is like that, but I'd say uh, the, the big majority is like that. If we go to impact investing, um, how does this actually translate into to projects, right? And how does it um, uh, translate into companies that are successful? Um, maybe you have some good examples or concrete examples from the last couple of years. What are like these success stories where, where impact investing itself inspired entrepreneurs, uh, gave them an opportunity they wouldn't have otherwise, and then it became a very sustainable, sustainable in the sense of financially sustainable business? Yeah, and I think the beauty with impact investing, um, fundamentally, impact investing tends to be much more patient capital. Um, so you'll find um, there's, there's a number of elements or a number of different um, vehicles within, in, within impact investing that helps to create a much more um, patient form of capital, unlike typical VC money where, you know, your typical VC investor wants to exit, let's say, hopes that you get a 2x valuation within a period of, you know, two years, right? And they want to exit by year two. Um, impact investors... I think it's more 10x now. I wish it would still be a 2x. <laughs> um, I think it's a 10x or you never hear from them again. If you just fair enough, you. Fair That's enough, kind fair of what happens. Yeah, yeah. I know, fair enough, fair enough. You can see I've been in impact too long. Um, but uh, but uh, at the same time too, you know, there, there are some... There's been some very amazing and incredible examples in Africa. Um, so 
when it comes to impact investing, you have what we call, um, so you have what's called blended finance. So you have what you, an element that you call grant funding that basically can match fund the, the equity or the debt that has been put into an entrepreneur. So you want to start off with being able to tap into some of these grant funds. So some of these grant funds, for example, um, may help you raise an idea. Um, let's say you're in uh, agriculture and you're building up, this is actually one of my clients, in fact, um, building a sustainable solution for um, um, a higher producing crops in which maybe you have a, a hydroponic solution, for example. Um, and the amount, if you had a traditional investor, you may have not necessarily had the opportunity to do as much research and development as um, you now could be because of this grant that is funded innovation, um, funded the innovation. So that's one such example. Another example is, um, uh, well, a lot of that is in agriculture, uh, medical, medical tech, um, and me developing certain med tech technologies. So for example, there was a, um, a respirator that was made with a crank um, and this is not necessarily something you would see in the first world. This is something much more needed in areas where electricity is not necessarily available. And once again, it was um, because of an, a family office who was willing to make an investment to this entrepreneur, much more patient in order to see the returns um, to be actually to actualize. It was actually quite interesting to see some of these unique innovations that come out of um, of impact investment uh, players. Yeah. Do you think, and I, I've been touching on this with a couple of different VCs over the last few episodes, and what, what we, we've been debating is, um, you know, there's this one side where you say, oh, Silicon Valley, this is where companies go to steal ideas and raise a lot of money and then get rich quickly. And then the other idea, the other hand of this is, well, if nobody, and often this basic research, the, the innovations often come from somewhere else, very often government funded. Indeed, they come out of universities, but they've been lying on the shelves for decades, for centuries often, and nobody monetized it. So it was actually to nobody's use. Like nobody could, could have any GDP advantage, no productivity growth from it because you couldn't use it. Sometimes it's a patent issue. Sometimes it is just a way to the user interface. I mean, there's multiple issues that where entrepreneurs come in and take the technology, monetize it. And it takes off. And the example is there's Mariana Mazzucato. I don't know if you heard of her. She's, a, she's an Italian professor. And uh, she basically says, well, the iPhone is, is basically all funded on public research because, and there's something to it, right? Because you can go down the list of probably hundreds, maybe thousands of different patents and developments that came out of universities funded by taxpayer money that are being based, uh, they're being used in the iPhone. And because this technology layer, you know, I always say it goes back to the Old Testament because basically everything you produce ever in old, in, since the Old Testament in technology, you've been using right now. Most of it you can use for free, all these layers, and then there's a little bit of layer you add on top of it, and this is how you create a new product. And the debate is, is, is often, okay, what, what is actually the driver of this innovation? Is it all this publicly funded research that goes out there? and creates real innovation, so to speak, very often very technical innovation? Or is it that Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, and not just Silicon Valley, but anywhere in the world, people come in and and layer a certain amount of um, usability to it, of making it sexy, so to speak, and then paying for the marketing, right? The marketing is very expensive to introduce people to a new product. And this is actually the real innovation. Now, with impact investing, where do you see is this piece of real in, in, in innovation, is it more where you feel this is on, on the side of, you know, the grand givers who probably also not just give money, but also give access to patents and other um, copyrighted material? Um, is it more on the side of the individual entrepreneur? Is it more on the size of an economy um, or like a larger um, entity, like a state-run company? Where do you feel the, the strongest source of, inf of innovation is in that sphere of impact investing once it happens? I'm going to speak for Africa just because that's my area and um, region of expertise. And I'm not too familiar with what's happening in Latin America and Asia. Um, and when I talk about the global south, I'm looking more at the perspective of 
most a lot a lot of the impact investment flows tend to go into the global south or emerging economies. But I really think you know to answer the question was what is the, what is the driver of innovation? I think at the end of the day, the driver of innovation is need, um, pure necessary like need of what's in the market. So for example, when I worked in Madagascar, um, and most many parts of Africa, you have inefficient electricity. Um, energy is such a problem. Um, and then it gets dark by 5 p.m. So you as a student, that you know, tends to happen in a lot of places. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. It's dark by 5 p.m. And so therefore, if it's getting dark by 5 p.m., how are you going to study? How are you going to read your books? How are you going to do your homework? Yeah. And so this, this, this was where, you know, uh, I spent a lot of my career on the renewable energy space um, when I lived on the continent. And this is such an interesting and fascinating space because you take it for granted in the Western world in terms of having lights. Yeah. Um, but that ability to um, create mini grid systems or uh, I worked on a project that was uh, introduced solar kiosks. So it was kiosks in a rural village, very far from, very far from um, the grid. Um, a couple of companies that are extremely successful on the continent right now have developed either little mini home systems and other um, energy efficient um, appliances that have been, you, you won't see it up here. You won't, and when I say up here, I'm currently sitting in the UK. You won't see it in the first world, but definitely these devices have worked extremely well. Um, one company, to give you an example, there's one company, B-Box, BB, B-Box, um, in, um, in, they're now in, I can't remember how many countries in Africa they are now, but when I had first worked with them back in the day when I was with a, um, uh, a fund, um, they were only doing their Series A, uh, they got funding from uh, USAID, they got funded, so a blended finance, as well as family offices, foundations, etc., now they have, I think they've hit an over a hundred million dollar valuation or 150. I think they, I think they are on their series C raised a hundred. And this is only within a period of six years. The innovation that they've created has been phenomenal. And I know from feedback on the ground, people who use their products, it's something that's been affordable, accessible, and that people can use. So I think at the end of the day, at least in Africa, um, what draw what the main driver of that innovation is pure need and necessity i'll give you another example i love education you know and some of the ed tech examples that have come out uh you have parts of africa um there's a u.n study on this and it actually like broke my heart um you'll have schools absolutely filled with children absolutely filled with children but the key problem is not getting the children to school. The key problem is actually getting teachers to teach and having teachers show up. So what was really incredible is there's been a number of different um, ed tech solutions, um, one of which um, is, uh, was, uh, uh, is Bridge International Academies. They created a tablet that basically has a whole curriculum. Um, and it's a whole learning. I don't want to say that anybody could teach, be a teacher, but it becomes easier to become a teacher uh, within that village. And the number one, the company has been extremely um, financially sound. Um, they've attracted a lot of various different investors in their company itself. Um, and then number two, you, you've you driven a, you're, the, the children are actually performing higher and better than some of the state schools because basically the, ch the, the schools are privately funded. So those are just two examples of where innovation has really come out of a need and filling a gap in the market. Yeah, you know, definitely the, the problem to solve is what the, the first VC question. And I think they're right with that. Um, and that's, that's, so it's more, it's more of an, I feel in, in, in Africa, it's, it's more, and I, I really want to talk and go into Africa. There's a, there's a bunch of things I have, um, questions prepared for you. Um, but, but in general, is my, is my observation, things that are more robust, things that are, um, you know, kind of outside the box, um, that are, that can function in a in a relatively unorthodox environment. Those things typically do well, and uh, I do have the impression that those are from my from my own travels in um, I'd say about seventy percent in countries to the countries of Africa. 
I, the, the, the amount of connectivity and the way connectivity has developed, at least in coastal Africa, and we're not talking about the Congo, but we're talking about Kenya, we're talking about Ken, Tanzania, we're talking about uh, even Malawi, um, which is not that coastal. It's probably five, six hundred miles away from the coast, and there is a lot of roads, but um, we can take Uganda, Rwanda, um, and the whole west coast um, of Africa. What, I, what I've noticed, it, in, uh, about 10 years ago, there were tales of the, uh, the uh, Kenyan ISPs who literally had to dock trenches. And they had trouble just getting anything um, through, through, through different property because it was so complicated. Nobody even knew who the property belonged to. And even if they knew, it was a very difficult permit process. And it seemed like impossible to ever have any internet from, from what I've heard from, from the ISP. But... What I wanted to say is that connectivity um, in general, most of Africa has been solved. Um, I've, I'm stunned by the progress in the, in a lot of cities, um, and maybe that's just mobile internet. Often it's not the uh, the regular internet, and it's not DSL, it's not cable, but it generally, say, one mbit speeds are pretty much available all over Africa, which I think is a, is a stunning um, achievement. Um, co- coming out of a situation where it's even, it's, it's still tricky. It's probably more tricky now to have, um, electricity supply than to have internet. If you take the phones, um, they, there's a backup generator and they generally work. I think that's pretty stunning. And that's, that's quite an achievement. And once you have that, then you have the ability to learn, right? You, you might not have a candle, but you have a smartphone, hopefully, that has a charge or maybe you have an extra battery. And then you can spend the night and learn and watch YouTube videos or whatever you, you need to learn. So I think this is a very, um, this is really empowering the continent or maybe in the future generation. Maybe this hasn't happened yet. We don't see the impact. And I think I'm waiting for it, but, um, Daniel Gross was describing that, and I fully, fully agree with him there. It's like he was saying, you know, the next generation of entrepreneurs, um, in terms of numbers, not necessarily in terms of um, what's applicable to the to developed economies, they, they're all going to be from Africa, maybe from India and maybe from China, but mostly he expects them to be from Nigeria, Ghana, from their, you know, population-rich societies in Africa. Do you agree with this? This is going to be the knowledge entrepreneur of the 21st century, or we are not yet there yet, or we won't be the next 20 years? We're going to see the next Wakanda. <laughs> okay. Wakanda is coming. Wakanda is going to happen. Um, you know, and, and I think, but it, 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 it just goes with time. You know, um, China had its, I, I remember when I started my career, everyone was, China had entered the WTO. Everyone was so curious what was going to happen with China. And then now all the wealthiest billionaires now come out of China. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's now Africa's time. I think when you talk about the ISPs in Africa, what's been fascinating is you, with technology developments, you also have the ability to leapfrog in terms of tech, um, uptake of certain technologies. You know, in most of the continent, they didn't have these ancient systems or the legacy systems that what you'd find in North America. So therefore, it was a lot easier to put some of the... Um, the technology required to get the internet speeds that we're now enjoying in the likes of Kenya. In fact, um, I have a, I have a, we have a, Sapiva has a, a office in, uh, in Nairobi and um, often my business partner in Nairobi is, it's much easier to talk to them than my counterparts in the UK. Um, that being said, it's not necessarily consistent everywhere. Um, uh, this past uh, year, I actually had um, analysts that were based all across the continent. So we had an analyst based in Nigeria, one in South Africa, one in Tanzania, one in Kenya, and one in Rwanda. And you can see who was able to consistently log in versus who not. So I think that's still going to be a challenge in terms of uh, consistency, in terms of where the next potential is. Absolutely. And we can see it when... Um, a couple, there's two Nigerian companies, and for the life of me, I wanted to look this up before I came on the call, but there's two Nigerian companies that have done extremely, extremely well. Meanwhile, let's not forget how successful um, many of the innovations and startups that are coming out of Kenya. Now, between Kenya and Nigeria, the two of them attract, I would say, the majority of um, VC funding that goes into Africa, and actually Kenya gets uh, probably the law, or, and South Africa, but I would say Kenya now is getting um, the most, the higher chunk of it. Um, but this illustrates that innovation is coming. There's a lot of ideas coming out of Africa, um, and um, we have some a lot of talented people 
Um, and not only the talented people within the continent, but you also have the talented people who are the diasporans who recognize, hang on a second, there's actually a lot of opportunities back in my home country. I'm here living in Toronto, or maybe I'm living in LA, or maybe I'm living in DC. Wait a second, let me see what I can do back. And you're seeing a lot of this, um, like when I lived in Nigeria, the number of Nigerians who uh, used to be living in New York or London and now have moved back to Nigeria because they know that the opportunities are there. Yeah. Um, the, what, what, what strikes me about Africa, um, and that's, that's you know, that, that the troubles in Africa has often been, um, oh, well, let's start with the good things, right? It's, it's been... And that's my gut feeling, and I might I might just not have enough insight. But you, you you've lived there for much longer. I feel the personal freedom is often on a much higher level. So things that we we um, in the West have tried to codify and say constitution that we tried to codify in a set of laws, they kind of apply on a on a social level. Um, in in many countries, not every country is the same. Africa is very diverse. Um, I feel they apply on a social level a much stronger, and the 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 ability to basically live your life um, without the state meddling with you or without groups that are state like meddling with you is very high. And this has a lot of advantages, right? It it gives you a personal freedom to develop yourself. On the other hand, it, it seems like it's very hard for people to come together and execute a nationwide or citywide or even a continent-wide initiative and often infrastructure like the internet, electricity, roads, um, basically safety, that's another thing. Things that that are a public good, but they are for the individual may be quite expensive to deliver, but if everyone just spends a dollar or two or what, whatever the number is on it, then it gets cheaper for everyone. The basic example is, you know, it's so much cheaper to make the roads nice um, instead of everyone upgrading to an SUV or a four by four and then replacing the shocks every two years. So these things are, are true on the aggregate. And I'm, I'm, I've often struggled and lots of things that we just talked about, they, they are kind of coming out of the, you know, very an orthodox set of infrastructure in Africa. Say so the example of Kenya, you have wonderful roads that are not just Chinese built, but they, they are as smooth as they can get. And then you have a dirt road that's barely drivable for like two miles. And then it goes back to the smooth road. And you're like, how is that even possible for people who come of it out of, um, you know, always compare that more to a, to a state run system like China, um, that we, we, we now accept, especially in Europe, maybe less likely in the US, where we feel this, um, the the it cannot if if that's one city then it should sooner or later even itself out in very in many African cities and very African many African countries these the contrasts are pretty stark. Um, do you do you feel after having lived there this is a good thing or this is something that will hamper growth? This is something that that is definitely a problem and we have to work on this or we should just ignore it and we should say well let's take the freedom enjoy the freedom and leave the downside as it is. I, okay, I'm going to say something controversial. Um, I think that one of the biggest, I think it's a bit major challenge, you know, to get that consistency, to get the, um, to have proper structures in which to follow. And why I say the fluidity of structures, uh, I personally have been in a situation where government regulations decided to change overnight, thus slashing our revenues uh, by uh, 60% based on the a particular tariff structure as a result of changing regulations. Now, that fluidity, um, I'm not going to say which country that was, but the fluidity of the government a being able to simply do that um, and also certain contractual fluidness <laughs> of uh -huh. certain yeah. um, it, I think can be um, the risk for many businesses um, becomes high. However, there is the element of perceived risk versus um, actual risk. And what we're seeing in a lot of African countries, which obviously you, if you are interested in investing in an African country or partnering with an entrepreneur or working with an entrepreneur or investing with an entrepreneur in a particular country, obviously you need to do your due diligence to see 
uh, what has been the key trends of the country and how how it's changed in the, let's say in the last 10 years or what it's been doing in the last 10, 15 years. And I would definitely say that, say that there are certain darlings of Africa. Um, you know, everyone is investing in Nigeria and Kenya. Um, you know, I, I, I looked up the number and basically during a five-year period, um, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa accounted for 53% of the 3.9 billion of VC funding that went into the continent. So you can see there's a lot of confidence going into those three countries. Uh, but what about the other countries? What about the likes of Ghana? What about Cote d'Ivoire? What about... Um, what about like Angola, Mozambique? You know, what are happening with these countries? So I think that um, as somebody going in, I think it's really important to make sure to do due diligence. Is it good to have, I think every, there's 54 countries in Africa. Every country is going to be really different. Um, how their policies and best practices are. I The controversial thing that I'm going to say, and this is simply from my experience of living in various different countries um, and having produced different reports, I don't think a lot of countries necessarily might are, are essentially ready for democracy. I think that, you know, there are certain countries that um, need to have a firm oversight of how their countries operate. And I'm going to give you the most solid example that everybody uses, the Singapore story. And if you look at what's happened in Singapore, you know, back in the days in the 1960s, Singapore was simply a fishing village. Now, today, Singapore is a developed country, one of the largest economies in the world, yet, you know, it's run by a dictator, right? Um, by comparison, I'm of my ethnic origin is Filipino. So my parents are from the Philippines. The Philippines in the 1960s was extremely wealthy. Asian Development Bank decided to put their headquarters in the Philippines. The Philippines was a democracy. Big mistake. The country wasn't ready for a democracy. Um, and if you look at it, the GDP of the Philippines is actually one of the lowest in Asia. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an absolute mess. You talk about these inconsistent roads, that's the Philippines for you. Um, and this is a country that I don't think was ready for democracy. Uh, when you look to their Singaporean neighbors who have done incredibly. So I think that... Um, I think it's going to, we'll see what the trends are in, in for certain countries and what they're going to do. Um, unfortunately, there have been a couple of bad examples that I'm so disappointed by um, as well. I, I gave some of the good examples, but I, I've also seen some of the, um, the unfortunate ones that have happened in the last couple of years that, or the last couple of years particularly, that just broke my heart. Um, yeah. I'm fully, I'm fully with you, and I think this is controversial what you just mentioned. And I just had Niels flagging on, and what, what it, basically his mantra was, and we kind of got into an argument. Um, he basically said, you know, democracy, rule of law, that's all you need. Everything else, you, you, and that's true for outside the organization. That can be a, you know, an institution, can be a company, can be a, can be a country. You don't have to think any further. And I think, and he 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 made that example. Um, obviously, the U.S. is always the the, uh, the founding fathers and the idea of the Constitution, and then it spread to America, spread beyond America later on. And I think I'm um, I'm glad you bring this up because that's 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 one thing I I've been uh, thinking about. Um, and it's 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 more complicated than this. So first of all, I feel the rule of law. People think this is just the set of laws, right? The set of laws that are encoded, and then we they are being applied universally to everyone, including the leaders, right? And then they're being by an impartial judge. They are being, uh, if there is a case, they're being being used as like the way we can we can referee this. But there's more to it. The, the problem is uh, you can always. Um, even if that's all true, you can always, as the, the, and that's the problem with democracy, and Benjamin Franklin said that democracy is literally um, two wolves and one lamb deciding what they have for dinner. And the, the problem with this is the majority, the 51% or the 51, whoever wins the election, how close um, it gets much closer now, as we see in the US, basically can determine everything for the next four years or for the next eight years. And by that time, maybe the other half of the country is bankrupt because these laws are not universally, they can always be written in a way that it's not universally applied. And that's one problem. So you, you kind of can use democracy to exploit the rest of the country. Used, maybe I'm using a very harsh word, but you can do this if you have that intent. And 
That's one problem. The other problem is, you know, you, you, democracies eventually, they're risk-reducing mechanism and they find the right solution over time, but they can be wrong for a very, very long time. And we, we, we saw this in, in, in Egypt, right, where, where the, the U.S. was very pro-democracy and then the wrong people won and then we're like, um, we're not that pro-democracy. We kind of changed our mind on that, right? So it is, it is a little more tricky than this. And I, thirdly, I feel, and I, I hope you share that, it's, you know, the, the idea of democracy, it needs a certain amount, it needs a certain trust in the system, let's put it this way, something that's a withering away in the U.S. right now. And it needs institutions, it needs people who have grown accustomed to this idea. And I always feel it's a bit of an Old Testament tale, right? It's, it's kind of a, it's a merge of the Old Testament and the Greek um, knowledge that became the New Testament. It became a very European idea, but it took like 2,000 years to actually, from the idea, from the, from the initial setup, to actually produce something that resembled a democracy is just 100 years old. And I feel, I'm not sure if it's a good idea to leapfrog this, because if a, if a country has developed very differently, and lots of African countries have developed literally as tribes, right? They haven't developed as big countries. They're basically Europeans came in and said, okay, this is a country, and people were like, whoa, what do you mean by this? Uh, this is my, the, the rest of my tribe is in the other country now, and I can't visit them. Um, yeah, that's how this works. So it's, it's a very... And, but you see this also in Asia, where a lot of countries are supposedly democracies, right? But maybe they aren't really the demo they aren't the outcome of a democracy is not the same. And I, I like this example of Singapore. The risk I think is always higher with an autocracy because they might be really messy dictators, right? They're going to kill 20% of the population and just exploit the rest. But that's always a big risk, right? And democracies usually don't, they are not as harsh. They can be, it can go wrong, but it's usually they self correct relatively quickly. And I think the hope was I mean, with the independence and then after some countries adopted democracy, some adopted um, a Russian-style model and then came in the 90s towards democracy. You always feel like the people who would make the, the country progress the most, and mostly that's economic progress, they would win all over the board and they would more or less be honest. Somehow this hasn't really, in a lot of places, and, and this is, I think, what you mean, or maybe you can help me understand what you mean by not ready, I think the whole country and the way democracy works is a relatively new concept in a nation state, uh, not in a, in a community, then it's definitely not a new concept, but in this, these relatively anonymous nation, state, nation states. I, I, I think I agree with you. I think if, if, and that's a big if, if you can create maybe a smaller entity like a city state or a charter city to go in and have a little more control and less democracy, Maybe that's worth a shot. The question is, 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 is this ever politically acceptable? Is it ever politically correct? And that's the question I can't answer. Maybe you've thought more about this. How would you solve this problem? I think, you know, and, I, and I'm really glad that you brought up the element of tribes and you made me realize and recognize something very important. So a lot of these emerging economies or emerging markets, you have to remember, they're also very, very young countries. Most of Africa got their independence in the 1960s. When I was referring back to the Singapore example, also another country that um, became independent in the 1960s. The Philippines was under colonial rule for 400 years. We look at parts of the former Soviet Union, um, them trying to navigate through. Um, I was on a project in Ma Macedonia as well as in Georgia and them trying to navigate through what is their system in their countries. It's so yeah. new. And I think that it's really important, the point that you brought about, like some of these countries were basically forced in to become a country. And it's like, why am I a country? Like, why, I don't, you're not my tribe. Why are, and where did my family go? And I thought that was a, a brilliant um, example that you gave. And this, this goes back to what I'm saying of, are these countries really true? They're so young. They're so young in their systems. They're so young in their forms. So therefore, to implement an institution or a framework that isn't necessarily made for them, is made to push down on them and to say, this is what the framework is. Also, when you are looking at a more democratic um, system, I think you need to have a, a proper foundation. When I say a proper foundation, one of the reasons why I find certain countries consistently successful as a whole, is there systems that are in place 
there's there's three aspects that I think is really important for our country to have, um, which will then make a, a better population, et cetera. So number one is a good education system. Number two, a good healthcare system. So if you can educate your people, you take care of the health of your people, um, and then education, health, and then the third is, and there is a third one, but at, well, those two are really like the two like sounding blocks that I always like to, to say, if you take care of, if you take care of the education and you take care of the health, then you have a more productive society, a society that can actually go to work. You know, if they get sick, you have some treatments, if you're able to, you know, and you look at the, you look at countries like Norway, Sweden, my country, Canada, um, um, the likes of most of the Northern European countries, you know, these are well-functioning um, countries. Uh, and because of that fundamental, the education, uh, the combination of education and health. If I personally don't worry about my education and I have the opportunity to learn and grow, um, and therefore also, um, you mentioned earlier about uh, a lot of democracies a lot of countries using democracy to actually exploit the country. Well, yes, I agree with that comment because a lot of countries or a lot of leaders may actually use the uneducated, this is going to sound terrible, but people who are not necessarily less educated, they get the popular vote, but that ne not necessarily is the right leader for the country. Whereas had the population been a little bit more educated, uh, educated and had a uh, ability to take a more critical outlook as to what's being presented in front of them and therefore make a more informed choice, then I think we would see a very different example. Um, so yeah, I think that that that's, this is why, you know, when I say that countries aren't ready for, there are certain countries that may not necessarily be ready for democracy. Um, this is why I feel like you, you can't, every system is going to be different. Every country is going to be different. Um, yeah, we we're gonna we we're gonna walk through your statement on Twitter, so that's gonna be interesting. Anyways, now um, I'm what, what, what this. I think it's it's hard to describe, and I, I feel we 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 have a lot um, that we feel is wrong there, and it, you know it's a bit like China, where, where everyone thought, okay, just economic growth will make them very democratic. They're gonna look like Taiwan, and it's a safe bet. It happened all the time, right? If they make money, they're gonna become more democratic. It didn't happen with China. It happened with almost every other country on the planet. Um, one thing that's that's um, that struck me and that I learned only recently is how socialist Singapore is. Um, so Singapore is always seen as the as the the heaven, the haven for wealth, and it has very low taxes. Um, it's uh, very easy to set up a company to close a company. It's kind of like Hong Kong, but on the other hand, it provides free housing um, or reduced income housing for a big portion of the population. In Singapore, maybe fifty percent. It uh, has tight restrictions. Um, on immigration, surprisingly, so it has the opposite of, a, of an open border policy. Maybe that's not a socialist. It has um, an almost um, free healthcare system, kind of like the, the many European countries have that, like the UK. Um, so it does things quite differently than what you would think when you think of Singapore as the haven of capitalism. And uh, Singapore, as you say, um, was was certainly, I wouldn't say it was a crazy dictatorship, but it was certainly not ruled by on, on, on a state level and uh, by, by, the, by the people living there solely, but by their leader. Um, his last name is Lee, I forgot his first name. He's been there, who's been doing this for 30 years, right? Um, so the, the question is, how, how does this really work for developing countries? Because obviously, so there, there's a couple of things at odds here, right? The first thing is the, the wars and also development is, is always counted in economic progress. So like if you lift the GDP, as hard as this sounds, but you make everyone sooner or later rich and everyone has a better life and has better access to better health care, better, better access to education. So I think we can all agree, maybe this is not the only thing we should worry about, but in the end, if we, we have markers and it's easy to measure for GDP, then everyone is, is profiting from this, from this rising tide. And then if we can agree on this, right, and I think everyone agrees on this, um, there's a couple of sub-issues, you know, you don't want to do it at all costs. And this is where we talked about earlier this, we want to not ruin the environment we are in, um, especially not for others. Once we agree on this, how do we actually, there is, you know, there's a virtual signaling, and I call it the, 
the new neo-colonialism of virtual signaling, right? When you, when you go to Africa, there's a lot of people who I think who want to do good, like NGOs, those are typically the NGO people. They um, very often, they're European. They're the only ones access to, besides the government, really expensive cars. Um, they live in their own um, separated area. Um, they go to certain restaurants. And you can, you can, you can tell they're from an NGO from 100 miles away. I mean, you, you can see, you can talk, you can... Seek out these people. You can you can distinguish them from the rest. Um, that's not that has nothing to do with race. Um, and these people, I think, have a good motivation. They want to help Africa. Uh, in 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 my from my point of view, I felt there's often a mismatch between the skills they bring, the costs that they have on the ground. So I'm not sure they're making enough impact. And I want to learn more about that. I feel like they're not doing enough impact. The question is, if we feel Economic progress is what we want. How do we actually get it started? So, so what would you do if you would be the dictator of, say, Malawi or Madagascar? Well, what would be your first, what is your six-month plan? Um, so one is just to attract more investment. Um, and so, you know, like I, let's, let's talk about the NGO um, aspect. I think what's really important is a lot of NGO funding is now starting to go going to impact investing. And... Um, a lot of the funds that would have funded um, more charity or philanthropic work is you're seeing a conversion towards impact investing. And the reason why it's converging to impact investing is they're realizing that philanthropic work, there's essentially a cutoff. You know, you put money in and then there's no payback coming back out. Whereas uh, in impact investing, it's a perpetual fund. You know, the aim is to eventually create a perpetual, perpetual fund so then you can also uh, continue to make impact on a wider scale. Um, so that's where you'll see like a lot of family offices, for example, um, what where they used to have very philanthropic um, initiatives, a lot of... Um, the family offices that we've been that we've worked with and we've 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 advised um, have moved into impact investing and realize actually my money will go so much further if I actually make sure that my my money generates more money and I think this is the, the this is the end principle how can my money generate more money. Yeah. Um, so whether it's uh, whether it's uh, from an entrepreneurial point of view, whether it's from um, more established businesses who are doing, you know, um, entrepreneurship within a wider, larger organization, I think that it's really important. One, a government would ensure to incentivize a business community um to develop and grow and recognize what are the business needs what are the economic development needs and how can we therefore support or encourage and allow for um, external investment to come in i think the the hardest challenge that i find with a lot of investors that i've worked with throughout my career um, has been being able to put money in and and or take money out so you have to be able to as a government you have to have this conducive environment where people are willing to put their money into the country um, and can also take which is so important if you can't take money out so i think that's where i would, I would really start uh, i would really start with making sure that if i was a government my policies are conducive um, to a business environment that will encourage and allow for um, the various sectors that need it to thrive. Um, um, at the same time, too, I think it's really important to cook consistently and ensure that the companies are paying their rightful dues. Uh, and when I say rightful dues, that a government recognizes that we need to tax you know, an organization. I, I'm not opposed to taxes, um, but it has to be the right taxes. You know, it has to be uh, a reasonable amount. Um, unfortunately, there was an example of a government in an African country very recently who decided to, they were going to tax all the mining companies an absorbent amount. Well, basically all the, all these companies left the country. And you can't do that, you know, it has to be fair and it has to be right. So I think create policies that ensure a right balance. What is that balance? Once again, it depends on the country. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's definitely a very d difficult question. The, the, 
I think there is something, and I want to talk about that. Um, there is, um, from every 10 years, there's a spectacular rise of certain countries in, in Africa. It was Angola, um, uh, lately Nigeria, and usually it's commodity driven. So we see, um, and I think this is this is not a good way to grow because it, it creates something called, called the Dutch disease. Um, it makes any other um, um, service that you deliver or products that you create in that country much much more expensive because your currency violently uh, rises. And it, it happened to a bunch of countries, and it, it, it seems to be a cycle. It. So on one hand, I admire the the uh, the commodity entrepreneurs. Like right? uh, sometimes they're big oil companies, but there's a lot of entrepreneurial service businesses along with this. So basically, they 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 find um, the the actual um, sites. They they um, they create the environment, the, the infrastructure around it. They 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 hire local people. So there's a lot of potentially good there, right? But I feel like uh, when Africa is booming. It's generally about commodities, and uh, then it drizzles off, and that money is spent, or I feel like it lands in London bank accounts or in Swiss bank accounts. Um, why do you think is it the commodities who go in first, who obviously are are able to absorb a higher amount of risk? And is this something we can learn from it? I think there's a huge boom and bust cycle, but is this something we can learn from people in that industry who are able to absorb that higher amount of risk? <sighs> Commodities, it's the, it's the commodity curse in Africa, as you um, are rightly re referencing and referring to. Um, I try to work in a space that encourages investment outside of commodities. So I try to work in a space that encourages investment into areas like renewable energy, um, agriculture, fast moving consumer goods, um, education. So I, I, the work that we do at Sapiva, you know, our hope, as well as my work that I've been doing at Luciano Capital, is our hope is that, you know, uh, we can create very profitable, attractive businesses um, that therefore we can move away from the commodities dependence. Um, and if you look at uh, one initiative that we are hoping to push is in the DRC, you have um, a lot of artisanal mining. Um, and a lot of this artisanal mining is very dangerous, very hazardous um, in certain parts of the region. So, for example, the world largest, world's largest deposit of cobalt is found in the DRC. And cobalt is what you need for your semiconductors, your, for basically all your electronics, you need the cobalt. Now, a lot of, for example, a lot of women work doing what's called domage, like the most, some of the most dangerous jobs, very chemical intensive, um, um, it's challenging. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to push initiatives to encourage, hey, look at this wonderful fertile land. Why don't we consider growing um, art? Uh, why don't we consider growing um, 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 horticulture? Why don't we see if we can, uh, how do we implement uh, fish farming? How do we implement um, other cattle? that could we encourage and move away from being dependent on the commodities. And when I say commodities, I'm saying commodities such as uh, copper, steel, nickel, you know, the typical uh, metals. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I necessarily answered your question. I kind of deviated away from the, the areas that we're trying to encourage. Um, and we know that it is a curse like the, the resource curse. Um, the other thing I feel that... It, I, feel it, I feel it doesn't have to be, right? That's why I, I agree with you that the outcome hasn't been great and the track record is terrible. But if you look at countries like Norway, who've been using the oil valve um, and, bu and building something on top of it, right? So it is possible. And, and uh, you know, the, the every oil company, every commodities uh, company has the same problem we just talked about, right? They have to assess the risk. Could they get the money in? Then maybe they can get it out. Maybe not. They never know what happens. In the meantime, right, there's polit they have even more political issues. They obviously have bigger budgets, but in the end, they have the exact same problem and they need to build a scalable local organization and they seem to pull it off and then they all leave and then they come back 20 years later or 15 years later. Um, I wonder if there's something to be learned. I, I fully agree with you on the negatives, um, but maybe there's something positive there too. I think there's a lot more mining companies, for example. So um, um, I've worked on a lot of Canada, we're a major mining um, country. 
in terms of our mining interest in Africa is, is very big. And you'll see from that, there is a lot of trends towards more CSR, but CSR evolving into much more impact investing. And uh, we're actually been working at Oceano Capital, we've actually been working on initiatives to encourage mining companies to look to impact investing and the practices of impact investing. So where the differentiator is, if you're on a, if you have a mine site, a lot of mining companies will wave their flag and say, "Hey, we built a school, yay!" You know, or we built a hospital, oh, woohoo! What we're saying and what we've been working with is, okay, so rather than building a school, why don't we identify a number of different entrepreneurs or maybe introduce um, new agricultural practices? There's a shortage. After doing some research and feasibility studies, there's a shortage of this, this, and this. Uh, let's say uh, cattle, uh, uh, maize, and uh, corn, for example. And why don't we fund the initiative for them to be able to grow these and then be able to find identify off takers to therefore sell it? So I, I, I'm starting to see a trend towards that. There's a lot more conversations happening in the mining sector, for example, um, on ESG best practices and the move away from corporate social responsibility. I think it'll take time, um, but uh, definitely. And I, in the case of Norway, you know, the example that you give, I think it's also easier when the country is smaller and it's a smaller population to be able to manage. I think that's a that's also a major factor of it. Um, and Norway is a country just overall, just in terms of its social practices. This is, um, we haven't started talking about the, the area that I'm passionate about is gender lens and women, women's empowerment. But if you look at Norway, N Norway has one of the most gender parity. Um, and part of their systems uh, is that they encourage um, you know, maternal and paternal leave. They incur, it's a very equitable from a gender perspective society. So I think that, but they also have a smaller population to be able to implement these measures and, and manage these measures. Plus they've been wealthy and with the, with the oil that they've had. So in terms of the resources, so yeah. Yeah. I think we're, we're, we're and I think it's hard for us to, to, to get all the way down, I think there's more to it. We're scratching the surface, and uh, that's that's been a problem for myself. Um, it's there is something deep there, but I can't really put my finger on. And I haven't read a lot. I found a lot of good stuff that that explains more of that, and that's you know intellectually honest enough. Um, why why don't we short circuit this and look into places that seemingly are doing a good job, right? What do you think? From from a, and this doesn't have to be um, impact investment. That's just a sustainable economic growth um, in Africa. Where do you feel which countries are like in the top five um, where you feel like whoa they're really they're getting their shit together? And then there's the other end where you feel like whoa it's maybe there's growth but it's definitely not sustainable. So in terms of the countries where um, that is basically the investor darlings um, would definitely be in East Africa um, and then Nigeria, um, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Ghana um, in West Africa. Um, with the exception of taking out Tanzania, unfortunately, um, but the likes of Kenya um, doing really well. Uganda will see how things turn um, and how things shift. Rwanda has been, you know, um, Kagame really wants to become the Singapore of, of, of Africa. Um, he said it time and time again. And if you go to Rwanda and you see what Rwanda has, has done, it's absolutely, absolutely incredible what Rwanda has done and achieved over a short period of time. Um, I say this with a caveat, however, because you then also talk to people who are not Rwandans, uh, but who are expats, maybe they had moved over from Tanzania or moved over from uh, Zimbabwe. Um, there's a lot of, it, 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 Rwanda feels a bit tight. <laughs> like when I say tight, maybe not as free as they, they're, they're a bit, maybe a bit worried. So we'll see how, how Rwanda evolves. What we hope, uh, we hope that Rwanda becomes the Singapore. Uh, but we also hope that Rwanda doesn't become another Zimbabwe, where, you know, a leader stays too long. Once upon a time, a Zimbabwe was incredibly successful. Uh, Zimbabwe, um, the currency, one point was um, 
on par with the British pound a long, long time ago. And then unfortunately, over time, uh, under bad leadership, um, things went down the drain in, in a country like Zimbabwe. Um, so I think the plus countries right now and the ones to watch are obviously Kenya, which has always been the case, Nigeria. But Nigeria, when I say Nigeria, Nigeria is tricky. Nigeria is the most population populous nation in sub-Saharan Africa. So of course you're going to have the angel, you're going to have the, the unicorns that are going to come like there's a, the unicorns of Africa are coming out of Nigeria, which is, I think, really interesting to watch and to see. Um, but it is also the most populous nation in Africa. So your market is massive in Nigeria alone. So I think Nigeria is something everyone's like, oh, Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigeria. I'm like, okay, well, you actually have to look at it differently because it's 100 million people, 150 million, 200 million. No one really knows the true census of it. Yeah. So top five countries, I would say. Um, in no particular order, Kenya, um, Kenya, Rwanda, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, which I think are the typical ones. I didn't put South Africa in there. Now, the reason why I didn't mention South Africa is I just feel like South Africa is on its own little South Africa. <laughs> it's South Africa. Yeah. Africa. So I, it's I, not Africa. I agree with you. It's, 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 it's not what we think of Africa for, for sure. Uh, what about Ethiopia? Would you put that in the top five or maybe in the top 10 or where do you feel there? Top 10. I would definitely put it in the top 10, but I think that um, certain political, and this is where it becomes interesting right now as we watch Africa right now. Um, there's been just a history of many countries um, showing that political instability ends up affecting the risk profile of the country massively. So I think that with Ethiopia right now, it was a couple of years ago, an absolute darling. Now with some of the political turmoil getting kind of iffy. So it's, it's almost like, let's wait and see how the how the waves turn. So the, the case in point is Tanzania. Unfortunately, it's gone you know, 10 years ago, Tanzania was on the up, 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 up. Everyone was investing in Tanzania. Tanzania looked brilliant. Uh, there was a lot of things going on in Tanzania. And then a new government has come in. And oh, so on the bottom end, that would be on the bottom end, for example. Okay, that far down. Okay, yeah. I mean, I, I, I felt like Ethiopia, when we talk about a more autocratic system, they, they are like... Um, the blueprint for it, right? They 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 look towards China. They they're kind of communist, but kind of not. I don't I don't see a lot of communism there. That's actually real. Maybe they have that, but I, it's it's from the people you talk to, and uh, they might not give me the whole truth. It's very far out there. I grew up in Eastern Germany. It was way more communist, uh, way way way. So the, it maybe there is something there, but they, what they really want is, and um, maybe this is something that we we talked about earlier is. You know, a system where they can stay in control as political leaders, uh, they can have some di direct impact on this economy. Um, China has a lot of state-run companies, but it has gone into this virtuous circle of we we make we primarily invest into infrastructure, we primarily reinvest all these savings, and we don't just base them on some government propaganda, whatever they do, they do this too, but there's enough money in the system to make everyone richer because they reinvest it in the, into the economy, which is something the... Uh, Soviet Union also did, but I think they didn't go to that full extent, and they, uh, you know, they 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 um, basically prohibited any kind of real market transactions, which is what China does in a lot, a lot of places. So Ethiopia has jumped on that train, and I think what what there was a lot of enthusiasm. The, the trouble is obviously in Ethiopia, infrastructure projects are still very tricky because you start from zero. There's literally no roads. Um, they build a train in Addis Abeba which looked like a subway uh, from China, which probably what it is. This is a ch all Chinese Chinese money that builds those, right, in, in terms of um, political allegiance um, in exchange for that. But the train, it, it doesn't really work, right? So, I mean, it, it runs, but it's there's like it's really slow. Um, it goes like 10 miles an hour, and it's, like, it's constantly overcrowded. And it, it's just it, the idea of a train and what it actually did um, didn't really... They were not in sync, because Ethiopia uh, or Addis has... They never had bad traffic, right? Because they didn't have a lot of cars. So they had buses, and these buses were stinky, but they work. Um, 
and the train were kind of was like the the elephant in the room and uh, it's it's nobody wants to deal with the elephant if you can just take a bus and get that five minutes instead of waiting for two hours for the train which is brand new but it barely ever shows up because of tons of issues so I think Ethiopia maybe that's what you're describing they they wholeheartedly tried this Chinese approach and uh, as you say they are a little stuck um, maybe it's the political issue but it's somehow the Chinese model is not a one-to-one -one copy for Ethiopia. They have to change it. And this, these changes and making it work, I, I'm not sure it, it will happen the way that the current um, leadership in Ethiopia wants to deal with this. Um, to be honest, I actually don't know what's the right solution in Ethiopia. It's a lot of smart people, right? They don't have an education issue. They have it in rural areas, but in the cities, definitely not. Um, they all speak English and, you know, the... the, the uh, the local language, um, which is very complicated. So the education is not an issue in urban areas. There is a lot of, um, there's a lot of agriculture. Um, um, there's a lot of things that, that Ethiopia has going for it, but it managed to be one of the poorest countries forever, which is striking to me, right? Um, do you think, well, what would be the better approach for Ethiopia? If you could describe one, do you think there is one? I can't prescribe one because I really, I hate to say it, but honestly, like, I think a lot of it is going to have to do in leadership. And because the, the, the challenge with many of these really young countries, and when I say young countries, you know, Ethiopia is, you know, the oldest civilization in the world. However, in terms of its current form, it is a, it, it's still a young country, just like in all the other African countries, also very young countries. Um, so I think that political risk is, unfortunately, for a lot of these African countries, um, uh, a major factor. And um, I witnessed firsthand um, a country that was just so on the up and up and up and up. Um, and, and when I say up and up, not just like from external investments, I'm talking about the people inside the country who were innovators, who were entrepreneurs, who were pushing brilliant ideas. Uh, one company that I was working with got from zero to two million in two years, you know, and, and, and this is in Tanzania. And I say zero to two million U.S. dollars. Yeah. And there was there were several examples of the Tanzanian owned, operated, funded company, fully funded. Yeah. Um, then the the current president put that the business owner in jail. Um, you know, so it, to extract money, or they had a feud, or, or what was the reason for that? They decided that the 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 uh, the, the um the current president um a few years ago decided to take out the people who he believed to be corrupt, um, and therefore um, a number of leading business people in Tanzania were put into jail um, and uh, during that time period. And, um, and, and yeah, and to give you an example, this is the same president that has said, we have, there's no COVID in the country and we have prayed COVID away. And I'm, I'm quoting word from word from what that president has said. So, because I've watched this within my time frame of working in Africa, and it was the very Tanzania was the very first African country that I came into, that I worked in. Um, it's so close to my heart. Um, I do believe that in a case like Ethiopia or any other countries, unfortunately, it's still so dependent. The the top level infrastructure, the political infrastructure, is still too fragile, the foundation hasn't been fully, fully built in, that unfortunately it can really just move too quickly in a different direction um, still. So that's something that still needs to be monitored. Yeah, no, I, I, I fully, fully agree with you. And uh, Ethiopia, you know, for instance, they shut down the internet for a couple of weeks because they felt like that, like, like talk for everyone. And then they just, there's like the city of Bahia, the second biggest city, they just shut it off for like a whole year because they felt it's too dangerous to have people um, probably organize demonstrations in that city, but still. The, the shutting of the internet is, has been very common in many countries in Africa the past two to three years where there's been a lot of elections. Tanzania shut down their internet last, like uh, 
just just a few months ago, I had an intern working in Tanzania and she's like, I can't, sorry, I can't deliver this. And I'm like, I said, like the internet's been shut down. Nigeria shut down their internet as well. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, we think that Nigeria is a darling country to invest in, which I gave you as my top five. Yet earlier this year, the government shut their internet down. Yeah, that's not ideal. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't realize that. I know Uganda just uh, slowed down the internet during during um, their the, the the final stages of their election um, last month, or actually it was this month. Um, what when you when you look at these challenges, um, and I I always I I kind of think like Africa in many places because it was not as populous uh, 50, 60 years ago, and because it was run by tribes. So there's often a system of elders, and I think that works really well. That often is on a village level, right, or is a part of a community. Do you think that's something that can be instituted? And maybe we are looking at the wrong level, right? This nation state is a, is a if we go back, a very European idea. Even in the U.S., we don't really think of we think of the U.S. as a nation state, but it's way too big. It's essentially a European idea, right? All these nation states, and um, even many countries in Africa have like populations that are widely divided between prior tribes or just different languages, different religions, and. Do you think, are we looking at the wrong level and maybe we should go down a layer lower and say, why don't we talk to a certain community and um, push the idea of the, like a charter city that gets a certain political independence. Now, we, we can debate what this should be. Obviously, it should be a way to uh, have access to money, how to deal with their imports and exports. Say, like an advanced um, um, duty-free zone, kind of like a, like a Dubai-style duty-free zone that you institute in Tanz around the Tanzania port, for instance, and you get those rights. So maybe we have to put some troops there in order to get some, some, some boots underground. Do you think that's maybe a way to go to just say, well, we take certain areas out and we, we, we get a guarantee to try something for 20 years, kind of like Hong Kong was to China? I think so, like that model is actually working in certain sectors. So, for example, in agriculture, you see a lot of the co-op model. Um, I was actually talking to a Canadian-based entrepreneur who actually um, um, imports all of his goods from two African countries, from Malawi and I want to say Malawi and Ma Malawi and Mali. I remember I was like, oh, that must be so difficult to always say, Malawi and Ma Malawi and Mali. They're quite working. far apart. Yeah, quite far apart. Yeah. Yeah, but that's where apparently he imports his goods from. And so he, uh, so um, I think his father or his mother, basically he had ties to both of the countries. And as you mentioned, working with the elders. So basically he went into these communities um, and working with the elders and working, uh, whether it's with a female smallholder far farmer, and actually he does really focus on working with female smallholder farmers. Um, and therefore um, he guarantees that he's going to be the off taker he um, has uh, essentially uh, uh, buys the, all the respective commodities. And so it, it functions and really works well because um, this area of agriculture is independent from the other systems. And he basically just goes directly to the tribal communities. And I've seen this happen in a few others where you work directly with the co-ops or work directly within a community. And therefore, so it works really well in agriculture, in an agriculture setting. Um, I've seen it work in a renewable energy setting, but from a point of view of, of if you're, as long as you're, if you're really far off the grid. Um, so if you're really far off the main public grid, and if you want to establish your own mini grid or um, some sort of other type of innovation, I think that works quite well. Um, so, and, and they, they have, they, there are these free trade zones um, in, in several different countries, um, where it seems to, it's, it's mixed. I would say I would definitely, I wouldn't say that there's a lot of people that have been extremely overly hyper positive about it, but nor, nor have they been hyperly negative about it. So I think it does work both. I, I think it, A, it will depend on the sector, um, and B, it'll de obviously depend on the country. Yeah. Well, the, the idea of, you know, moving Dubai into Africa. I think this, as you said, Rwanda wants to be that. It's unfortunately very landlocked and is dependent on a lot of things. Um, that's There is definitely room for this, maybe just one or two Dubais. Um, and uh, I, I, he, the question would be if there is um, the political will to, to try that out. And I, it's sometimes stunning to me that economic progress, and we kind of predefined that in the beginning as, as so important, 
maybe this isn't what a lot of people optimize their life for in, in, in Africa. So I'm not saying it's, it's unimportant, but I feel the importance of it is, is maybe not as striking as it was, say, Europe in the 18th century or the 19th century. Uh, do you think that's true or that's, that's, that's uh, too broad and, and, uh, and a judgment? quite broad, but I also, you know, you have to also factor in a younger generation. And I think the younger generation, um, you know, Africa is, Africa is going to have the youngest population in the world by 2020, like the 20, I think they, the predictions are by 2030. And also these young people, um, uh, the younger generation have a lot more access to information. It's a very, you know, so therefore their needs and their desires and their wants are fundamentally going to be very, very different from a, the generation before them. Um, and so I think that um, and where, and therefore thus, where the opportunities lie, um, you know, is, is, is significant to be able to target. And I think this is one of the reasons why the uptake, for example, in fintech in Africa, has been incredibly high. If you if you watch and monitor what happens in fintech, um, like mobile payments, being able to buy and purchase, online purchasing is really significant, and it blows my mind because you know the um, the uptake in smart uh, smartphones um, on the continent. Uh, you 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 gave an example earlier of like, well, even if I don't have electricity, I can have my smartphone, and it maybe I have a generator or something. I'm, absolutely, it's true. So. I think that the 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 younger generation is going to have very very different needs than what the generation beforehand is, um, and at the same time too, you know, this is why we also need to make sure we are investing in the young entrepreneurs. We are taking the time to ensure that these young entrepreneurs are getting the skill sets, they are getting developing the skills that they need to be able to navigate through and develop. Um, businesses, because at the same time, um, one of the major reasons why um, the turmoil that we had in Nigeria uh, earlier this year was because of a young, educated population that is unemployed. And a young, educate, uneducated population that is unemployed is a ticking time bomb for a country. So yeah. we need to make sure that um, Jobs are being created. Entrepreneurs are being supported. If an entrepreneur is supported, then more jobs are going to be created, um, greater impact, better stability. So I, I do think that economic development is incredibly important for a country's, um, the current, for the current way um, uh, the countries are going um, in this direction. Yeah, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Once, once they've... Um They've watched enough YouTube influencers. They're gonna be. They, they're gonna want what the influencers tell them. Um, yeah. Um, you, you know what? There, there is. If we, if we, if we go further, I, I kind of wanna, wanna talk about what could be that potential edge. You know, what, what could be something that that Africa has on a, on a on a specific level that that no or many countries in Africa have that no other um, place has, and. When you think of China, what they basically understood is that they have a large labor force they can direct, right? They can basically tell them what to do. I don't want to use the word slaves, but sometimes that is kind of what we look at it. It's not true for if you would live in China because it's still better than your prior job. But you would you would basically learn that you would say, take any big market um, that you find in the world, um, find out what the products are, disassemble them, um, Reestablish um, how you could build them on your own, but cheaper. Um, then go to the exact same customers, tell them this is the product, we give it to you cheaper. Why don't you let us manufacture it for you? And then you can say that's stealing the, the, the intellectual property, and maybe it is, but so everyone did that at one point. The US did it from, from the UK, and then um, it, Germany did it later on. Um, so the, the, that's, that's the cycle of development. You make something cheaper, so you, you're more productive, um, and then you rise up, you innovate yourself, and then eventually be, became the dominant manufacturing because they have the sort of, you know, skilled in that sense, not, not super skilled, but skilled enough for these kind of manufacturing. And they also had the management potential to pull this off. And this is a mega industry, and I think this is where Ethiopia wants to go. I'm, I'm, I don't think they've, they've made many inroads there. Um, for, for, Africa, I see that manufacturing hasn't led anywhere um, for multiple issues, infrastructure, getting products in and out. So even if you have good manufacturing, it, it never really took off. 
Um, what do you think could be the next, or this edge, or this mega industry where Africa could make a huge difference? I'm going to say agriculture because I'm I'm biased towards agriculture. You know, 60 percent of the world's arable land is in Africa. Um, I worked on a project where uh, we were able to develop a counter crop, a medicinal crop. That was a counter crop to rice, and it was inc it's an incredibly high value crop. So, if you are able to introduce these techniques, um, obviously it was a very complicated crop to grow, um, but the climate in um, this country was very conducive for this particular medicinal crop to grow. Um, you, you're seeing, for example, a lot of countries. Um, a lot of countries have, are now allowing license uh, for um, uh, production of medicinal marijuana, um, whether it's simply growing the cannabis uh, versus actually exporting. I mean, the cannabis industry is going to be massive or is already massive in terms of the value um, in Europe alone. Um, now with the, the use of CBD oils, the use of um, moisturizer. I'm here in the UK. I just entered my Holland and Barrett, uh, you know, one of these UK drugstores, and you have a whole section. So I do think these high value crops, whether it's um, things like Moringa, um, whether it's cannabis, whether it's things like Artemisia, there, there's so many high value crops that um, Africa is uh, an area that can really has proven and can produce these these um, these these commodities. Um, not only that is you know a lot of countries in Africa still have to import a lot of their food. So even and, and we didn't talk about this, but the Africa Free Trade Agreement that was signed um, and rectified uh, ratified last year. This is this is a is a major game changer. You know, within Africa itself, um, the African Union, the amount of now trading and the ease of trading that it's going to represent. So this is also a very big opportunity because when your market was once only Mozambique, all of a sudden. You now have access to Angola, you have access to Botswana, you have access to um, all these other countries. So your market now has just become much larger. So I think that's also a, a very interesting opportunity that the African Free Trade Agreement will represent. Um, and, and I think that, you know, in terms of fast moving consumer goods, so you have the agriculture side, you have the effects of the African Free Trade Agreement, and then you have a massive uh, potential in the consumer uh, consumer buying. This is a this is a continent that um, buying and increasing spending power um, is 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 definitely on the rise. Everybody wants whatever they're seeing on TV or whatever they're watching on YouTube, and you're seeing that this is why a lot of the um, like the, the the alcohol companies, the beer company, everyone's flocking. The the cosmetics industry um, is now flocking into Africa. The it was really interesting. Chris Rock did a, a documentary on hair, the hair industry in Africa, women weaves. My goodness, it's massive. And there's a there's a, an incredible example of a Japanese entrepreneur who basically, apparently the Japanese hair is like the most incredible and the amounts that people are paying for this. So I think there's a lot of potential um, in in agriculture, in fast in consumer goods, um, and leveraging on the effects of the African Free Trade Agreement. Yeah, um, I mean, generally, it's it's not a must have, right? But generally, you have some kind of export led growth. That's how most economies take off and then eventually get rich, and then they end up like Japan. They have too much money and they don't know what to do with it. Kind of what the what the US should be, but we we still consume a lot, right? We we overly consume um, over here. Um, I, when I I was expecting you to to also um, I don't know if this is still current. There there've been plans for a long time that um, solar energy panels, uh, massive solar uh, factories would actually be installed in uh, in northern Africa, um, more towards the coast. Uh, are these things, and that would be an enormous boost of um, free energy or low-cost energy, renewable energy um, for Europe. It, are these plants still in place? Do you, are they still being built or this has been shut down by, by often very difficult political um, political situation in these countries? Unfortunately, Torsten, in the countries that I've 
seen and noticed. Uh, so I've watched, uh, there's a couple of, of projects, the major solar, uh, major hydro, and major wind uh, projects. And all of these countries would be brilliant at producing um, um, copious amounts of energy, uh, renewable energy. Unfortunately, I think the political situations have um, not allowed or enabled some of these uh, major massive energy projects to come to fruition. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, the company that I worked for, one of their portfolio companies was a um, uh, was an energy like had invested in an energy in, in in the like what would have been the largest wind energy farm in um, in East Africa, the first wind energy farm in East Africa. We're talking about it was you know um, hundreds of millions, uh, possibly even hitting the billions in terms of the value of that project and the amount of money that had went into it. Unfortunately, it had that didn't come to fruition. So we've been talking. I was advising a uh, Canadian solar energy company and they have just had so many challenges with their um, solar energy facilities in Western Africa. So, um, so I think that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a harder one that I, unfortunately when it comes to energy production, there's a lot of other players that we may not necessarily be aware of that might be hampering the full potential of what it can be achieved. Yeah, it's it's very vulnerable. Also, and you need it, they're they're just physically vulnerable. You need a certain amount of maintenance, and you need a long term agreement, right? You need to be sure that this thing delivers for 10, 15 years at least. Otherwise, it makes no sense. And I think at the time it was. It was a bit like, you know, there's these huge parts of the Libyan desert, the Moroccan desert, and the idea was to just basically pump all this power to Europe. I think it was made, maybe a bit of a pipe dream because um, Europe has so much money and they're ready to spend it on renewable energy. Germany, um, you know, has this very high target of renewables. So I think it's about 50%. And they, they have the most expensive electricity on the planet because of that. But they're ready to spend for it. So, I mean, that's that's their decision. And obviously they thought, um, why don't we put all the, the wind generating towers in a, that kind of make our or landscape Markley, why don't we just move a lot of solar farms where they actually can produce uh, a lot of energy. Germany is mostly cloudy and dark, but if they would be in Morocco, that seems like a match made in heaven. But but yeah, I mean, the political instability is, is real. It's a real issue there. So they, I have never, they probably have built some, uh, but I've never seen them take off you know, on a grand scale. Um, yeah, there's a couple of projects that have been built. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that that explains a lot there. Um, here's one mega trend that I've been thinking about, and I, I've seen this here in the U.S. and I think the U.K. You guys are on, on the same level there. Is that people are making steps to kind of leave their physical existence, and this is not just a COVID thing. I think this happened for quite some time. So, um, and a lot of futurists. I had David Orban on. He was talking about you know basically it is time to 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 have mind children, not just biological children, um, tongue in cheek. So I feel like this, this idea of merging with the cloud, so to speak, and I, a lot of people have, by, I mean, forced by COVID or maybe because this is what, what, the pe what people find more comfortable anyways, they've maybe been making moves to spend most of their life in the cloud, consuming cloud, producing stuff for the cloud, kind of what we do with the podcast, right? It doesn't have um, a, a physical um, address, so to speak. I always feel um, Africa is, is in a fantastic position for that, right? That there's a lot of places that speak the same language. There's a lot of places that um, could contribute to this growth of the cloud. And, and I was referring to this earlier. I, I, I feel like Africa is not just ready for this, it's like destined for this, because literally all you need is an internet connection and a brain, and uh, um, then you, you contribute to this cloud economy. But the question is, is this going to be enough, right? Is this like what China, the China's manufacturing, is the cloud economy enough for Africa? Um, what's your gut feeling? Do you think that's going to happen or this is just going to be a minor thing? I think technology as a whole will be a major thing for Africa. I don't think, like, I really don't think manufacturing is going, is not, I don't think that's what it's going to be for Africa, but I definitely think technology, uh, technology and innovation. So whether it's uh, building systems that 
serve up into the cloud. I mean, the company that just raised, and I was just trying to look it up as we started talking, uh, as as you were referring, I mean, they, I think they, they hit their 100 or $200 million um, uh, capital raise very recently. Um, and it is, it's all tech. It's all, is very, it's technology, it's technology. Um, and so I really think that for Africa, the biggest area that it's going to be in terms of opportunities is tech innovation. And what is that, what does that tech look like? Whether it's ag tech, um, ed tech, um, um, just, just general, you know, uh, look at, look at the proliferation of M-Pesa, mobile payment systems, um, uh, delivery systems. I mean, I just feel as if, um, you're going to have to have some really, really massive servers in Africa and sitting in Africa, um, if they're not already there, which I'm sure they, they already are. Um, and, um, the proliferation of, what technology is going to look like on the continent. That's where I think the major opportunity is going to exist. Yeah, I feel it's more like this, this soft layer on top services. I think the, 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 the ship for the data centers has already um, sailed, or maybe that's, that's wrong, but I don't see Africa being excelling again. That's an infrastructure part where laying the pipes, building, uh, building um, big data centers, but it's just layered on top. You know, I don't want to say entertainment, but the, the softer layer of, 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 uh, the e-commerce um, of um, how do the world learns. I always feel like, and I said this to Daniel, I feel like 50% uh, of the teachers are going to be Nigerian and they're going to teach all our children um, because this is where we're, this is the most efficient and maybe the most qualified staff we can find. It might also be in India um, because the, the current model of school seems to be broken. Um, what When you... When you when you look back at your own career, and, and that's kind of an, an advice for, for other entrepreneurs, uh, what attracted you to what you do in the first place? And if you, if, if was it a certain talent that you had, um, or how did you discover you, you want to be um, kind of as a strategic entrepreneur? That's, that's how I would describe you, right? You, you're, you're like a, 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 lay, a layer on top of that and helping investors making the right decisions. When did you decide that was for you? And uh, do you think that was random or there was some, some talk to you at some point? <laughs> I think it was complete. I really, when I look back at my career, I realize it wasn't random, but when I was living it, it felt random. And, and the reason why I say that is because I started my career off just like, I've always been curious and I have always had a curious mind. And I think that for many entrepreneurs, if you don't have that curiosity, like what is that? You, you mentioned earlier that entrepreneurs tend to be very ph philosophical. Well, I also think they have to have a curiosity, you know, because they want to make something or change something or disrupt something um, and and therefore that 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 inquisitive mind of not just accepting what things are um, but how can I blah 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 finish the sentence right how can I blah 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 and so for me um, you know when I left Canada um, I had this amazing opportunity to um, work in country reports and basically I would interview um, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, I would interview heads of state, uh, ministers, various different governments, you know, I've, I've talked to the, some of the biggest companies in the world um, and, and therefore, you know, it, it was really intriguing. Um, uh, we were our aim was to be able to promote a country and attract investment into a country, which is how I ended up living in so many countries. And in so doing that, I realized that, hang on, if I really want to make a difference in this world, and if I really want to do something that can contribute to the greater good, it's got to be an entrepreneurship. You know, it's got to be at the level of business because business is, will, is what generates growth. Capitalism, being able to make money, um, fuels further growth, makes further impact, etc. cetera. Um, and so I, when I did my MBA uh, and when I went to business school, it was of that mindset. You know, you have to understand, I studied like journalism and communications. I never thought that I would go into business and finance, and which is what I do now. Um, I didn't think that I would be looking at financial modeling on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not what I thought I would be doing um, uh, when I started my career out. Um, so I, I did an MBA with the projection of going into entrepreneurship so I could learn the business skills and get the business acumen to better understand. And knowing that eventually I wanted 
to become an angel investor was kind of my, 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 my be able to exit out of certain companies and then become an angel. And that's basically, you know, what happened in 2000, I entered the, after my MBA, it was, uh, I did the MBA just after the crisis. So you couldn't get a job anywhere. Um, Which crisis was that? There's so many lately. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 2008 or 2008 financial crisis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the 2008 financial crisis um, yeah. is when I did uh, when I had done my uh, MBA and and that's where you know I I, I I fell in love with Africa. I fell in love in Tanzania specifically, um, and I just decided to move back to Tanzania and um, and I, like come with me. We'll see what happened. And while I was in Tanzania, I met an investor who was like, "Look, I have this company. Would you?" can you run it? Can you take over it? And I said, okay, cool. Happy to do that. And that's basically how my career evolved is I worked with a lot of investors who, whether they are, uh, whether they are an angel investor, whether they're a private equity fund or whether they're a VC fund, um, oftentimes what'll be is, okay, this is the business. Um, can you have a look at it? See how you can fix it? Where can you find some inefficiencies on it? Great. Fantastic. Let's do it. Um, and then eventually, you know, the trend into impact investing came very naturally um, because I was already working in Africa and because uh, I, I was actually part of a, one of the first um, crowdfunding sites that really specifically focused on Africa and the development uh, funding projects across the continent. We, we managed to raise $25 million, um, funding 12 projects and 35 projects across the continent. And that for me was like, you know, I, I really just enjoyed um, being able to do that. So I, it was a very, um, I always often say, it's like, you never know what's just going to come at you. And I have a, I have a, I have a German niece and nephew actually. Um, and uh, my niece is uh, 22 and my nephew is 17. And I say to her, you know, like, they're, they're, they're very in a stringent system that I need to study this and I need to study that. I'm like, yeah, but you know, you never know what life is going to send you. And I'm of the opinion of just keep an open mind. Um, and I, I, and now today, like, I love what I do. Like I, I feel very fortunate to be able to work in a space where, um, I get to work with investors to ensure that they, you know, they are investing in women, they are empowering women, they are empowering the lives of, of people on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and at the same time, too, they're making a financial return. The other side of it is I love seeing all the different ideas that entrepreneurs have and saying to them, okay, hang on, let's take a step back. How can we make you grow even further. So it's been really fun in that way. One of my clients, just to give you an example, I just love what they do. They're basically the Uber of Africa um, in terms of artisanal mining. So they've developed a technology whereby they're able to uh, work with um, artisans in the slum areas, tell them how, like, they basically, through the app and through the system, they tell them what jewelry they need to make, the jewelry is made and created and sold to the likes of Macy's, uh, you know, uh, Neiman Marcus, these, these, these big stores in the U.S., um, beautiful jewelry. And yet they're empowering 3,000 artisans in the slums of Kenya. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is a fantastic idea. That definitely sounds um, like, like a real niche. Um, it, I like how you describe that. I like how you describe your career, and obviously we, we see a different looking back, right? And when we when we go into it, and uh, the the um, the way that we feel like we were destined to do this, but at the time it felt kind of shaky. At least that's that's kind of what what, what I felt uh, at the time. Everyone and I grew up in Germany. You know, you you vary in Germany. You don't leave a certain career trajectory. You ride it until the end, until you literally retire and you can't go to work anymore. You have a heart attack and you fall fall over. This is the system they've 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 been doing very well with. It's changing a little now, but it's you know slow. It's slowly changing. Um, I never felt, and there were lots of cross points where I felt like, okay, I can't do this. I literally can't do it. And then five years later, I'm like, okay, this made sense. But like, I was in this moment and I'm like, I, I just, I feel it, right? I can't really say why this is so. And I couldn't explain it to anyone because everyone obviously in Germany or then here in the US had a very different idea 
um, on how life should be. So it's 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 funny how we look back and we say, okay, this this is what I wanted, but I couldn't express it, and then it it, it drove me towards a decision where I eventually didn't have that need to rebel anymore. Right? I felt like I'm I'm in the right place um, at the right time. Um, a lot, and a lot of entrepreneurs say this about curiosity. You're absolutely right. That's that's absolutely a precondition. Um, when when you look at, and I think this is a lot of what investors describe is, it's a bit of a, they're being um, torn between just operating a business for some time and, uh, you know, being at the controls. And on the other hand, being so far away, and I think we, we have this with Africa, we think it's so far away, literally, or just because in terms of cultural um, uh, cultural markers, and then it's hard to call someone, it's always in the middle of the night. Well, how do you feel by making these investments um, and, and kind of being, or advising on investments and being on the outside? Do you feel like, okay, I could go to Tanzania and could run this place and I know it could work, um, but I just have to wait until someone gives me the results two years later. Do, are you getting impatient or that's never been an issue for you? So I always say, I personally um, will advise and work with investors who want to be close to their entrepreneur. So... Mm-hmm. Um, and therefore build up the entrepreneur. And, um, and I always, so on one side, if I'm working with an investor, it's we're working hand in hand with the, the entrepreneur. I don't want to say breathing down their neck, but understanding that, okay, this is like, let's coach them through. And I think it's really, 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 really important for an investor. Um, like, so for example, if you're a private equity um, investor, a lot of private equity investors may take a majority um, share, knowing that there's a lot that they know that they think that they can improve. Um, I always ask the question, well, why are you taking the business in the first place? Like, what is it about the business? Is it the entrepreneur itself or is it the business? And oftentimes I like, work, I prefer working with investors who like the entrepreneur and it's the entrepreneur that has the idea because often the the big entrepreneurs of the world that we have seen, you know, the the Teslas of the world, the Steve Jobs of the world, the Bill Gates, it was in them. They had this crazy idea, you know, it was, it was in there. They knew the solution. No one else could tell them what the solution is. They knew what it was and they did this crazy thing. You know, I think of like, who would have thought that Airbnb would be Airbnb today? You know, just crazy ideas. Yeah. But look at what it like. Look at what it's done. So on one hand, I think it's really this is just my personal thing that I I do, um, and it's also because I've run the companies myself. Like I've run companies, and I know how much more appreciative I am when I know that my investor is <laughs> is essentially out. Like it, it, it is not just going to leave me to be. Um, and is actually taking an interest because therefore I know that the money is going to work in my best interest. And in my best interest, when I say my best interest, my best interest of the company that I'm currently running or, um, or helping to run. So on one side with an entrepreneur, I always advise an entrepreneur, look, an investor is like a marriage. Don't accept the first event. Just because somebody wants to give you money doesn't mean that you should take it. Uh, Make sure that you're taking money and you're aligned in terms of values, in terms of principles, and this is where you want to take your business. This is your baby. You know, don't let anybody else tell you anything different with your baby. Yeah. Or be open to advice that may help, that you realize will help. On the other side with the investor, why are you taking the investment in the first place? Why are you making the investment in the first place? And how much do you really, like, what do you want to see out of this investment? Now, a lot of the investors won't have like time to, you know, really be at it on a day-to-day basis, but it's the fact that the interest is there or maybe they have additional, maybe there'll be a, a board, um, somebody sitting on the board that is really, really, like really knows and understand this industry or this sector who can provide for their off-taker, um, customers, solutions, market entry strategy, etc. So I like to look at investor, like investment from a strategic, more strategic perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, it's, it's been a, a big learning experience today. Um, I've learned a lot, um, and I really, I really um, thank you for your time and for the for the uh, the sheer. I can see uh, the the not just the curiosity, but the the passion that you have for for this topic and for 
um, for a continent that that hasn't seen uh, its its limelight yet, but I think it will um, change very quickly. Um, thanks for doing this, Ruby. That was fantastic. My pleasure, Torsten. Really enjoyed thanks it for, too. Thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. I hope we, I hope we see you again. <laughs> I'm sure we will. <laughs> and we didn't get a chance to talk enough about um, um, gender lens testing. We have to do this next time. You know, I, I, we, we would probably disagree um, on most of those, but I, I, I'd love to. I'd love to. I, I'd love to make this um, as part of a, you know, very, very open debate. Well, then, like you said, it's a learning, right? So I'm happy to have a yeah. There's obviously lots of things I don't know, and maybe this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing this, right? So well, there's a lot of preconceived notions, and it's just in the short amount of time that I'm doing this, couple last couple of months, um, I learned a lot of things, and I look at things very differently that I've never done before. Like, it, it definitely already changed me. Amazing, which goes back to, you know, why, um, uh, why uh, like, when we're doing something at the time, like it's like, why are we, why are we doing this? And then when you look back in retrospect, it's like, oh yeah, this made sense. This actually made sense in my career and made sense in, yeah. What made you start the podcast? Well, uh, some guests were remarking this and it's, it's certainly true. Again, uh, it's one of those things I wanted to do and I didn't really know what, um, why I was, I was getting into that, um, why I was interested in this, and I feel like in in retrospect, so to speak, and it's only been a couple of months so far, it's just using your own potential, right? Living up to your own potential. And when you start a company, and even if it takes off, um, and that's a big if for most most venture companies, but you 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 you're trapped in like a you know sixty hours a week lifestyle where you basically your investors and everyone around you just wants to find out what you could particularly do about the growth of that company, right? Which is what matters to everyone around you. And even if this company company is very impactful, um, it, I always felt like there isn't enough for me to really mark, make my mark on the world. And in, in a way, I'm interested in lots of different topics, right? That's what a lot of this curiosity, I'm interested in many, many things and know not enough specific about any of the topics um, that I'm interested in. So. Um, really finding out what goes on in other people's minds and giving a, a kind of a education, um, but it isn't doesn't look like education, doesn't feel like education to anyone. Um, that's what I really felt the podcast could be like, you know, learning from YouTube and also being discovering things that you didn't know you were interested in. And those were the motivations for me when I look back. Only it's only six, six, twelve months ago when we re, when I really started out. Um, I think this is what a podcast can deliver for me personally, but also for the people who listen to it. And uh, I learned so much from different podcasts and I'm, I'm stunned that I didn't have this medium before, or it could have been YouTube, right? It doesn't, it could have been a TV show, but a TV is just not delivering that. And maybe there's not an audience for it. It doesn't make enough money. I don't know what it is, but TV rarely delivers this. Maybe the exception is the BBC. Yeah, but at the same time too, I think TV has 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 lost its luster, you know. And I think people appreciate or need on demand. Like people need their Netflix now. People need their you know Amazon Prime. Um, whereas flipping through a television and waiting for a program to come on, <laughs> you know, yeah. fun. Like just to give you a, a prime fundamental example, um, my friend, um, uh, my friend has a three year old. Yeah. And was watching, you know, his cartoons were, you know, normally the cartoons are on. Anyways, went to his grandmother's house. Grandmother doesn't have um, Netflix. And, and so trying to explain to a three-year-old child that, oh, sorry, you can't, we don't have on demand. You know, these are, these kids, and this is what we were talking about in the, in the, in the podcast, like the, the new, this, this generation, this younger generation, these are digital natives, like pure, pure yeah. digital natives. And I think flipping to through a TV is too tedious for when you can go onto YouTube or just Google a podcast. And oh, oh yeah, it's yeah. I mean, the whole model has changed so much, and I think the uh, the what I'm hoping for the media consumption is like off the charts. You know, it's like from two hours or six hours on average per child. What I'm hoping is that there's a bit of this YouTube discovery that actually helps them discover the skills. Um, because that's you know that's a big if obviously, but it's it's my hope for this next generation, and it 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 is very egalitarian. You know, it is 
anyone in the world who has access to this can access the same, the same knowledge. There is no gatekeepers anymore, as long as you have an iPad or a phone with YouTube and decently fast internet. And I think this is what, what makes me so excited. There's this huge, hopefully this new, new bubble of entrepreneurship coming up. We've kind of lost in the US the idea of entrepreneurship. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's become a government program, so to speak, but it isn't a societal value. And um, that's, I came to the US because I felt this is the strongest here compared to anywhere else on the planet where I could be part of this in the strongest way. I'm not sure this is true anymore. Maybe we are seeing renewal. Well, I hope so. But it's, it's definitely in dire straits right now. I think come to Africa. I think Africa has really such a strong entrepreneurial vibe. Um, and, yes. and, you know, I, it is really going to become the new Silicon, like the, the next Silicon Valley. It really is. You know, there's just so yep. much ideas and innovation out there. That said, I do think that the European market as well, I mean, like Berlin has become this lovely um, ecosystem of ideas and startups and, 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 and whatnot. And I think that, uh, like it's it's just crazy such what technology has done and has created within a small period of time and and the case in point i told you i have german family so i have my german niece and my german nephew when my sister first moved to germany she was living in a really small town like really really small town um they only spoke like not even high deutsch they spoke um swabish she could barely understand anybody i remember yeah. visiting her, I actually had to learn German. Fast forward to, you know, 20 years, people in the small town now speak English. You know, yeah. all the kids that my niece and my nephew go to school with, they all speak English, which yeah. by the way, my brother-in-law's generation was not like that. My brother-in-law, he speaks English, but only a, maybe like one or two of his friends speak English, but all my niece and nephew's classmates I'm having yeah. conversations with them and it's a teeny tiny, teeny tiny little town in Germany. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely changed. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, uh, Germany has, has a, I feel Germany has a lot of potential. It's not, it's just never using its potential the right way. And um, we, 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 I don't know how this, how this is going to play out this time, but um, there's something in the nature of Germans. It's just not right. And we talked about the superiority complex on, on one of the earlier podcasts that's just preventing them from doing the right, the right thing, so to speak, right? I mean, what is the right thing? That's obviously up to debate and they will have a different view. But there is something nefarious there. And um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm digging my own soul. That's kind of a Dostoevsky theme, right? Where, where you kind of, you're constantly looking into your own soul and studying, looking into what, what can you actually contribute? So I'm trying to balance this. But there's something going on there that's not good. And yes, it's improving. And I think Germans also change, but it obviously takes a little longer. And they do a lot of things very well. I'm a little worried about Germany, though. I, yeah, I, I, I think that, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about Germany. I think that it's, um, I think that, like, I, I just think that the world is just much more global. I think we all have exposure. Um, I think, I think what's going on right now with COVID is an opportunity for just us to rethink how we do things. And I think it's also just crazy. Like I'm, I'm currently stuck in the UK. Like I can't get back to Canada at the moment. Um, yeah. because, you know, um, the UK has, you know, if you want to be scared of a country, be scared of the UK. But the, the UK now has the highest death rate uh, right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm very worried about the UK. And I, I love the old UK, you know, the, the 19th century UK, but the 20th century UK is not my favorite anymore. Um, that's always been been a problem for me. I, I feel like when I go through London, I'm like, man, can we just return time or just dial dial it back a hundred years ago? I, I, I don't feel there's another place, but in London, I always have that impression. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm really just sad about what happened here, like, you know, in terms of Brexit, in terms of, um, and, 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 you know, it's, I, I don't know, it was a global trend because don't forget, after, Bre after the vote on Brexit, it was Trump. And so we've had this like last few years of between the UK and the US, just absolute bollocks of craziness. Um, and then therefore it then encapsulated with COVID. Um, and and there, then, then you see these two countries um, with stupid leadership and look at what COVID has done to it. How is it that the UK has the highest death rate in the world? It's insane. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, COVID is, is, is definitely... Um 
Well, there's more to it. Um, but if you do a COVID podcast, it gets uh, taken off YouTube, so I can't do that. Uh, <laughs> you, yeah, you have to be very, very careful what you can say and what you cannot say. So um, you can basically just, you can say whatever is the official line in that moment, but if it's the official line from t- three months ago, that's a big problem. They, they just take it off YouTube. So, well, I can't do that. Um, podcast, the, the other side of podcast is easier, right? If you, the, the Apple, Apple doesn't censor as much. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Torsten, thanks, thanks again. It was so nice meeting you um, and, and chatting. And um, whenever you want to talk on gender lens investing, I would very much welcome that conversation. Uh, I, will, I will take you up on that. I definitely, <laughs> definitely. Thanks for doing this, Ruby. That was awesome. Thanks for taking the time. Um, let me know when you uh, publish it. Yeah. So I'll be yeah, able to absolutely. Show. It will be about a week, um, more or less. Sounds good. All right. Uh, Thank you. Talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.